Catholic Family Podcast presents Lent Around the World Daily Traditional Catholic Meditations Read by our friends from across the globe The Passion and Death of Our Lord Jesus Christ by the Most Reverend Albin Goodyear Part 23, Jesus Before Pilate The crowd of the accusers of Jesus and their satellites had gathered round and on the steps of Pilate's palace. Jesus stood bound at the summit of those steps between the Roman guard, rejected by his people. What was to greet him when the Gentile governor opened his door? He stood between two worlds, as did his apostles after him. The old one was that day ending. The new one had already begun but the door as yet was closed. The crowd below was not a large one. It was still very early in the morning, and though the city was already awake, there was much to be done by everyone that day in preparation for the Pasch. The street in which the crowd had assembled was narrow, for a single arch spanned it. This gave the impression to one standing on the balcony of a much larger number than was actually there. There were the chief priests and ancients, with the men who had come up with them from the house of Caiaphas. These were the main body, loud and clamorous and insistent, but it would seem, from the very nature of the case, that their actual number could not have been very great. As they had proceeded through the city, some few may have joined them, curious to see what was going forward at so early an hour and on such a day. But the elders expected no strong support from the ordinary people, whom they feared, and were anxious to avoid. Pilate the governor was within his hall waiting for them. As we have seen, he had been prepared for their coming. But the accusers disdained to enter into his palace. Their victim might enter, for he was already doomed, but for themselves, in a cause of justice, they clamored that Pilate who governed them must respect their religious scruples. And Pilate yielded. He committed his first act of weakness. From that moment the leaders were conscious that, whatever opposition the Roman governor might make, they had but to persevere, and in the end they would win. It was a clever beginning. On more than one occasion before they had beaten Pilate in a contest concerning religious observance, and Pilate was unwilling to contend with them again on what was to him a trifle. But his first surrender was followed by a second. He looked at the figure before him, silent and unmoved, yet stained with blood, bespattered with spittle and filth, with bruises marked across his face, obviously already the object of gross maltreatment and abuse. Justice should have said that here was one who had been grievously treated before he had yet been condemned. Before the charges were considered, something was needed to explain why these men had so taken the law into their own hands. But Pilate set this aside. When at his appearance on the balcony the howling of the mob had been silenced, he turned to them and asked, What accusation bring you against this man? He said nothing of the man's condition, nothing by way of rebuke to those who had treated him so roughly. His question, almost apologetic in its tone, gave the accusers courage. They could assume a defiant attitude, Though he had spoken as one who wished to go through at least the forms of law, they would let this weak governor know that their victim was already condemned, and that all that was needed was his consent to proceed with the execution. There was no need to formulate their charge, as there is seldom need to formulate a charge when hatred is the accuser. They would demand justice and their rights. They would claim that all their present held Jesus to be guilty, and that was evidence enough. Since Jesus had so many enemies, a whole street full of them calling for his death, it was the duty of Pilate to pass sentence according to the law of the land. They answered and said to him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up to thee. This then was the first charge these accusers of Jesus had to bring before the court of human justice. In their own court it had been quite otherwise. There he had been accused of threatening to destroy the temple and to build it up again in three days. He had been challenged to say in open court whether or not he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Once in the temple, 
it had been openly acknowledged that he was no malefactor, that indeed it was his very good works that they had been compelled to own. Many good works I have showed you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, For good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou being a man makest thyself God. Another time he had dared them to convince him of a single evil deed he had done, and they had been able to answer nothing. And now there is no charge. Jesus is to be condemned on an assumption, the common justice of the street, if he were not a malefactor. Since the leaders of men gave him this name, what remained for the rest but to believe that something in it must be true? But Pilate was not so easily to be induced to yield. Weak as he had already shown himself, he had also the subtlety of weakness. He had to defend himself from the charge of miscarriage of justice. He had to defend the honor of the Roman court. Perhaps, too, there was another power coming to support him if he would accept it. The presence of the man who stood fettered and helpless at his side. But for the moment, Pilate had no interest to consider this. At such a crisis, the form of justice would suffice for him. These clamoring men before him were obstinate and determined. They would stop at nothing to gain their end, and he was there to keep the peace. Whoever this Jesus was, already his presence was telling upon the Roman governor. The leaders of these Jews were clearly inflamed with deadly hatred against him. They were in no mood to consider right or wrong, justice or injustice, observance of law or its violation. He had but to let them have their way, and he would be freed from all responsibility. He had but to shut his eyes, and they would take the matter into their own hands. By what they had just said, they had implied that they had already tried and condemned the criminal who stood before him. In their eyes, he was a malefactor, and the judgment of a malefactor came within the scope of their courts. He could leave it to them to finish the work they had begun. Thus would he save himself. His words would be noncommittal. Should this rabble later go too far and violate the law, then, if it were needed, he would be able to proceed against them and act as an upholder of justice should. Pilate said to them, Take him you and judge him according to your law. The leaders heard him, but were not satisfied. The subtle and experienced Roman was no match for the far more subtle and astute Asiatic. With all the implication that his words conveyed, the acknowledgement of their rights, the willingness to accept their decision, they saw very well that they failed to cover all that they coveted. For the words omitted the death sentence. Above all, the sentence to that death on which they had set their hearts. A less sophisticated mind might have assumed that they implied it, and Pilate hoped that they would be so understood, but the expounders of the law were too trained in word-splitting to be so easily deceived. They would let the governor see that they were not content. Pilate had seemingly accepted without question their decision that this man was a malefactor, they would make him accept their further decision upon the sentence they expected him to pass, for that sentence belonged to him alone. Jesus was a malefactor, so they had proved, or rather had assumed, and Pilate had asked for no further evidence. Jesus was a malefactor, and malefactors were not stoned to death, which alone was within the powers of their courts of justice. He was fit only for the gibbet, stoning to death was too good for him. This also they would declare, or rather would again assume, and would see what this weakened Roman would do. The Jews therefore said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. As the evangelist St. John records this cry, it brings back to his mind the many occasions on which Jesus had foretold his death to his own. They had never understood what he had said, Least of all had they understood the prophecy as to the way he would die. For if he were to perish at the hands of the Jews, who alone were his enemies, it would be by stoning. Several times the attempt had been made and had failed. But death by crucifixion? That was the method of the Romans, 
and with the Romans, Jesus had never any quarrel. Now St. John sees the meaning of the Jewish protest. Jesus must not die as a blasphemer. That might make him a martyr, as many a prophet had been made. He must die as a malefactor, that his name might be stained for all time, that the words of Jesus might be fulfilled, signifying what death he should die. But the effect of this second demand was very different from that which the accusers of Jesus had anticipated. Weakness will yield to a point, but weakness driven to a corner will turn and retaliate. From this last cry, Pilate saw that he must be drawn into the affair. The would-be shedders of blood would act only on his responsibility, with his consent, insisting on a kind of death which he alone had the power to inflict. At once, then, he began to harden. If he was to sanction the death of this man, he must be given reasons. The leaders of the law saw the change, but they were ready. Hatred and malice find arguments to justify any situation. In their own courts, Jesus had been condemned because he had made himself the Son of God. In the eyes of Pilate, for the present at least, this would not count for much. It would not prove him a malefactor. It might only make Pilate take him for a harmless fool. That they might find acceptance by a Roman official, the charges they preferred must be political. They must show that this malefactor was the enemy of law and order, that he interfered with the Roman revenue, he was a danger to the emperor's authority. It was no difficult matter. Had there not been occasions when he had so stirred the people that they had risen like one man and had tried to proclaim him king? Had he not been known to question Rome's right to impose tribute money? Had he not said that he and his disciples were free from the obligation of the taxes? Had he not himself spoken of his kingdom, of those who belonged to it, of the conditions for admittance to it? Surely out of all this, they could discover cause enough to make even Pilate suspicious. They were quick to seize the situation. One charge followed another. So long as the governor was given reason for his sentence, he would certainly pronounce it, if only to free himself from further trouble. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man perverting our nation, and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, and saying he is Christ the King. These were surely charges serious enough to make any provincial governor pause. Perverting the nation, that is, a sedition monger, forbidding to pay the taxes, calling himself a king? Before such a judge, his enemies could scarcely have chosen their accusations more astutely, that none of them had been so much as thought of in the courts of Annas and Caiaphas mattered nothing. There, they had condemned Jesus of Nazareth for reasons of their own. Here, they were but seeking confirmation of their sentence, and any charge would suit their purpose. But by the first two, at least, Pilate was little moved. Like other Roman governors, he had his own means of information, and he knew his province well enough to value such charges at their proper worth. If there had been danger of arising anywhere, if there had been any refusal to pay taxes, he would long since have been informed. But the last charge was more serious. At least it roused his curiosity. No one could have lived long in Palestine in those days and have come to understand much of the Jewish mind without learning the place this dream of kingship held in the hearts of the people. They sang continually the songs of David. They clung without shadow of doubt to the belief that one day would come a son of David who would set them free. Though the very word kingdom had almost perished from the Roman reckoning, here it was always on men's lips. The First Examination Recollections like these were roused in Pilate's mind by the last accusation. This man said he was Christ the King. He turned and looked at the victim of hate who stood before him. He was a pitiable sight enough. If he had claimed to be the king of his people, he had already paid dearly for his false pretension. If he were a king, he had certainly been dethroned. Still, there might be something in what had been said. Christ the king 
The words meant more than mere kingship, as he, though only a Roman, could well guess. Moreover, there was something in the man himself, as he stood there at the mercy of them all, that made the governor pause. Mean and bespattered as he was, alone and apart from all the world, with not a hand to defend him, not a sword that could be drawn in his side. Still, it was against him that all this fury was raging. It was he who had roused all this bitter hatred. Such a man could be no mean creature. There might then be something in the charge, even in some sense which meant nothing to a Roman, which implied no danger to the empire. This man might be what they said he claimed to be. If he was, he would acknowledge it. If he did not, his denial would put Pilate at his ease, and would be ample reason to give him his freedom. Pilate would challenge him to speak. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? The answer was not unexpected, and yet it was given with a firmness, a directness, which made Pilate hesitate. No circumlocution, no counter-accusation against those who had brought him to this pass, no explanation as yet that the word had another sense from that which Pilate had in mind. Jesus had been asked a simple, lawful question by one who had lawful authority to ask it, and he gave the simplest reply. And Jesus answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. We look back on the life of Jesus and notice but few occasions when he has come in contact with the ruling Romans. Yet always there had been a deference, a friendliness which cannot be mistaken. The second miracle recorded at Cana, the cure of the official son, may well have been wrought on the son of a Roman. In Capernaum, after the Sermon on the Mount, he had healed the servant of a Roman officer, and on that occasion had broken out in praise of the Roman's faith. He had said that many would come after from east and west and would enter the kingdom when the natural heirs would be cast out. He had been the friend of the tax collectors, men disliked because of their service of Rome. One of them he had made a chosen disciple. When his enemies had come tempting him about the tribute, he had taken in his hand a Roman coin and had bidden men give to the Roman emperor his due. They had tempted him again because of a slaughter by Roman arrows in the temple court. But Jesus had not said a word against the Romans. He had only turned the occasion to speak to the Jews themselves. In his parables he had spoken of princes and kings, of merchants and foreign powers. He had always spoken of them with respect. Only at the supper that night had he warned his disciples, the future princes of his own kingdom, that their standards were not to be as were the standards of other rulers. But even then, he spoke with no word of complaint or criticism. Now, when we find him before Pilate, from beginning to end his attitude is the same. He treats Pilate always with respect. He calls upon him no woe. He will warn him, but he will not blame him. In his manner throughout, there is a consideration for Pilate which would have made one more sensitive to truth realize that he was dealing not with a criminal on his trial, but with a friend. Indeed, one might think that Pilate himself realized it. What Roman governor, with a despicable Jew, a Jewish criminal, before him, would have condescended to such lengths as Pilate condescended in his conversation with Jesus that day? Yet, as the hours of the morning dragged on, the judge and the criminal became only the more intimate. At first, Pilate had before him just a Jew for whom he cared nothing. At the end, he passed sentence on one who had won not only his esteem, but a place in his heart. But a little more courage, a little further response to the affection stirred within him, and not Pilate and Herod, but Pilate and Jesus might have been intimate friends from that day. Such, even under this ordeal, was the heart of Jesus Christ. The prisoner had given his answer, so plainly that there was no room for further questioning. He had spoken to Pilate as he had spoken to Caiaphas the night before. Meanwhile, the uproar in the street below became ever louder. The crowd by this time had increased, and its leaders had made it plain 
which way it should act. Let it be recalled once more that a crowd has little conscience or will of its own. It is more easily led by the powers that rule it than are the individuals who make it up, and it is far more merciless and thoughtless and cruel. This will account for much that happened that weird morning. As Pilate hesitated after the answer of Jesus, as he leaned over to the stricken man who stood before him, cries came up from the mob below, voicing ever new accusations. What they were mattered little. Many were terms of abuse and nothing more. What mattered most was that it should be brought home to Pilate that nothing but the blood of the man before him would appease them. Still, the man made no reply. He let them clamor on. He was unmoved. He showed no sign that he would defend himself in any way. He seemed to be in another world. What could Pilate do or say? If the man were so submissive, if he would do nothing to defend himself, how could Pilate defend him? There were no witnesses on his side, no advocate had his cause in hand. If he had said nothing for himself, his cause might be lost by default. He would stir him to speak. His answers would no doubt give some evidence on which he could act, since clearly his accusers were not disposed to be cross-examined. And the chief priests and ancients accused him in many things. And when he was accused, he answered nothing. Then Pilate again asked him, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, in how many things they accuse thee. Dost thou not hear how many things they allege against thee? This time Pilate received no reply. To such questions, silence was answer enough. As before Annas and Caiaphas, Jesus had declined to defend himself by so much as a word, so he declined before Pilate. Before both, he would confine himself to the simple truth and no more. Nonetheless, Pilate wondered at his silence. But Jesus still answered him not to any word, so that the governor wondered exceedingly. For there stood Jesus, between him and that howling mob, ready to destroy him if Pilate would have given them leave. And he was unmoved. He seemed careless of what would be. Already, if he were a king, they had done that to him which should have stirred his indignation and vengeance. But he was still unmoved. That in the end his life would be spared was now more than doubtful, yet he remained there silent, as if it were of no concern to him, rather as if it were a fate he expected. Jesus began to fascinate Pilate. He stirred his admiration. Pilate must see this man alone, apart from the clamor of the crowd, and judge of him more for himself. Pilate then left the balcony, where hitherto he had faced the crowd, and went back into the hall behind him. He made a sign, and Jesus was brought in after him. Others, forsooth, would not step across that threshold, lest they be contaminated. But for Jesus, who was already reputed with the wicked, who already bore the sins of many, this further contamination could matter little. Within the hall, Pilate sat upon his marble chair, the arbiter of justice. Jesus stood before him, silent, in his very silence seeming to command. Pilate had not forgotten the one confession that Jesus had made to him on the balcony outside. Whatever else he had passed over, he had plainly said that he was a king, the king of the Jews, king of these very people who were hounding him to death. He would test him further on this point. Clearly the rest could matter nothing. If he could but understand what this kingship meant, he would be on safer ground. Pilate therefore went into the hall again, and called Jesus and said to him, Art thou the king of the Jews? There have been many occasions in the life of Jesus when men have come to him to judge him, yet have always gone away knowing that he, not they, was the judge. We have seen it with Simon and Nathaniel in the early days by the Jordan. We have seen it again with the Pharisees, Nicodemus who came to him by night, with the elders and chief priests on many an occasion, with Annas and Caiaphas on this very night. 
So was it now with Pilate. The governor repeated a question to which already Jesus had given a plain and sufficient answer. It was now the turn for the prisoner to ask, and it would be not a timid question as of one who stood on his trial and pleaded for his life, but of one who was himself the master. It would be a question which would tell Pilate, if he chose to hear, that the man before him was not a criminal only at his mercy. He was a reader of Pilate's own heart. It would tell Pilate that Jesus knew that he had a double purpose in his question. Before, on the balcony outside, in presence of the accusers, he had asked only because the charge had been made against him that he had claimed to be Christ the King. Now, in the privacy of that hall, he asked for another reason. He was interested for his own sake. A light had been given him, and he had accepted it. It was one more of the many occasions in the life of Jesus when a light accepted had led to another. Indeed, at this moment, Pontius Pilate was very near the truth. He was not far from the kingdom of God. That moment was the turning point, not of the trial of Jesus only, but of Pilate's whole life. In Perea a few weeks before, a rich young man had come very near and then had turned away. At this secret meeting, Pilate was given a like offer, and he failed. But with what patience and even love he was treated, in spite of his own distress, in spite of all that depended for himself on this cross-examination, the lover of men laid his own care aside. He would treat this hard Roman as he would treat the tenderest child. Pilate had much against him, his Roman upbringing, his Roman contempt for the Jew his Roman assumption that he was not Roman, his Roman assumption that what was not Roman was of little account. Jesus knew all this. He would not urge this Roman. He would only induce him to reflect. Once more, as always in like cases, Jesus, by a simple question, would draw him to think upon himself. Was he the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or have others told it thee of me? It was as if he would have said, Pilate, out there before my accusers thou didst ask me this question, because others brought it as a charge against me. Now thou dost ask me, though thou hast not reflected on it, for another reason. Thou dost ask, not because of what men say, but because in thy heart, Let us begin to believe that it is the real truth. Flesh and blood are not revealing me to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus had indeed read and interpreted the mind of Pilate far more truly than Pilate wished. He had hoped to keep this secret to himself. He had hoped to discover more about this man while still he remained the Roman governor. And here was one, a criminal on trial in his hands, who read his secret, and with that knowledge dared to reverse their positions. Pilate was no longer examining Jesus. Pilate was no longer the judge of Jesus. Jesus was coming very near to being his judge. And yet, how gently, how considerately, giving him, if he would take it, opportunity for how much. By his question, he was appealing to him to be true to himself not merely to the Roman within him. If he would be true to his real self, there was behind that question an offer of light, of grace, such as Pilate could never have imagined. If he accepted it, if he would but answer that simple question, if he would only say that for his own sake he wished to know the truth, what light, even in that council chamber, would he not have received? Pilate would have been added to that noble list of the conquests of Jesus. Nicodemus, the woman of Samaria, the woman of Magdala, Levi, the Roman soldier in Capernaum, the many more who had learned to know and love and follow the friend of publicans and sinners. But Pilate recoiled. As before in the presence of the Jewish rabble, consciousness 
that he was being overcome made him act with a show of strength. So now, in the presence of this king, he was too weak to yield. A question had been put to him. He would not answer it. He would still play his part. He would be the man of the world he professed to be. He would pretend he did not care. What was Jesus to him? What were Jesus and his kingdom to a Roman like himself? Let others be interested if it so pleased them as it pleased a Jew. For himself, he was a Roman judge, and a Roman judge he would remain. The light had been given and had been rejected, and at once it went out. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thy nation and the chief priests have delivered thee up to me. What hast thou done? So, by another question, Pilate thought to recover the position he had lost. Whether Jesus were a king or not, he had enemies clamoring for his blood. Whether he were a king or not, he must have done something to provoke this hatred and bitterness. But Jesus, the hunter of souls, was not so easily to be turned aside. Pilate himself had come to him and asked him for the things that were to his peace, and he should not, because of a single refusal, be rejected. With the love of the good shepherd risking all for one lost sheep, while out in the street the wolves were howling, he would press his appeal more home. Pilate had shown that whatever befell, he would be a Roman. Jesus would assure him that from his kingship and his kingdom, the Roman need not fear. These would bring no danger to the empire, no danger to himself. The follower of Christ the king would be no less loyal to Tiberius the emperor. Were it not so, were Christ a rival of Tiberius, the battle between them would not last long. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would certainly strive that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now, my kingdom is not from hence. Pilate, in his fancied strength, which in reality was weakness, had already rejected one grace preferred by the man whom he feared to reverence. He now rejected another. Gradually the darkness was closing around him, for he chose to love darkness rather than the light. From a doubter, who nevertheless suspected where the truth lay, he was fast degenerating into a mere skeptic. He harked back to his former question. Jesus had drawn him away into depths he was unwilling to fathom. Pilate would save himself from being led further. Pilate therefore said to him, Art thou a king, then? This time... Jesus would reply clearly and without cavil. He had declared it before, when the question had been put merely as an accusation. He would declare it again, that Pilate might understand it in the added light he had received. For still would Jesus fight for the soul of Pilate. He had already appealed to him that he should listen to the voice that spoke within him, that he should be true to himself. He had assured him further that to follow the light and accept him would imply no disloyalty to an earthly chief. He could still be a Roman and yet believe. He would now urge his cause from another angle, the angle from which the heart of a Roman might be most surely reached. For the Roman honored nobility of character. The grandeur of Rome herself cast her shadow on all her citizens, and nobility of character is nowhere more manifest than when it pursues a noble cause. Jesus would make this last appeal to the finest things in Pilate. Though twice he had failed, he would not be the first to yield. We can see the beaten figure rise to its full stature, expressing kingship in every gesture, despite the bonds and the foulness. Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. For this was I born, and for this I came into the world that I should give testimony to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. For a third time, Jesus had appealed to the natural honesty of Pilate. From the very nature of his words, we may judge 
what was the character of the Roman governor. For here is everywhere. Jesus adapted himself to the one to whom he spoke. Jesus, who had always shown himself equal to all, to the simplest and the most subtle in the land, was no less the equal of a Roman. He saw in Pilate one who, before all else, would be what the world would call, then as now, a gentleman, with a high sense of honor, as men would measure honor, with a desire to be what men would call just and true, strong in the virtues that would make him stand well with his fellow men, but on that very account stricken with a fatal weakness. Because other men were his standard, because other men were his judges, nothing must be suffered to make him fail in men's eyes. On the one hand, no dishonorable act, as they would understand it. On the other, not even truth itself, if it spoke in language different from that which was spoken in his circle. When that came to him, when the voice of truth threatened to put him out of harmony with the world that was his ideal, then the voice of truth must be silenced. And that was never difficult. If truth cannot be contradicted, she can usually be questioned. If she cannot be denied, she can at least be made matter of controversy. Above all, if a question is asked, and we do not wait for an answer. Such was Pilate, eager to stand well before men, and for that ideal, willing to sacrifice the one thing that was for his peace. He listened to this king of truth. He felt again the impulse for higher things within him. But as twice before he had failed, so now he escaped by the subterfuge common to his kind. Truth? Pilate said to him, What is truth? And without waiting for a reply, he rose from his seat of justice, passed the king of justice by, and went forth again to the din of the crowd outside. How many are those who through the ages have imitated Pilate? It is an easy way to kill conscience, an easy escape from the call to all that is noblest. But in the very act, we prove that we are cowards. Thus, in another way, is conscience apt to make cowards of us all. Pilate left Jesus alone in the inner room, lamenting this, his third failure to win a human soul since his prayer in the garden. He came out again before the crowd. While he had been with the prisoner, the leaders of the people had not been idle. By this time the crowd had grown, and the newcomers, no longer their own on whom they could rely, must be attuned to their purpose. Jesus of Nazareth, the contemptible Galilean, had been unmasked at last. Whatever he had seemed to them before, now his power was clearly beaten. Whatever miracles he had seemed to work, now his power of magic had deserted him. Those who before had believed in him might now see how mistaken they had been. The elders and chief priests, their lawful leaders, had been right after all, and the people responded. They had reason to be ashamed of their former allegiance. They were annoyed that they had been so deceived. They were only too ready to have their revenge, to vent their wrath on this manifest impostor. The chief priests and elders had indeed good ground on which to sow their seed, and during this interval then made good use of their opportunity. When Pilate again appeared on the balcony above them, he found before him a mob, larger in numbers, more stirred to fury, more determined than ever not to be balked of its prey. Still, it would make another stand. The cross-examination in the private room had had a peculiar effect. Question as he would, it had been an examination of himself rather than of the Nazarene. And he had come away convinced of one thing. If he admired truth, Jesus of Nazareth was true. If he honored nobility, Jesus of Nazareth was noble. If he respected strength, without any doubt... Jesus was strong and void of fear. To condemn such a man was surely impossible. He could be accused of nothing. Then he too would be a man. He would pull himself together. He would defend this Jesus, 
this clamoring mob should not overcome him. He would tell it plainly that he found the accused not guilty. And when he had said this, he went forth again to the Jews and said to them, I find no cause in him. It was indeed a feeble defense, and the accusers were not slow to recognize it. It was almost a half-confession that he was on their side, that if he could find cause he would condemn. They must press their case against such feeble opposition. Of all things, Pilate would be most affected by the charge of disturbing the peace. They would urge that point. It would show the governor that the mischief made was not confined to Judea only. It was also spread through the Tetrarchies, where his own authority was limited. Jesus was a danger to Rome. His influence was greatest among the troublesome people of Galilee. If Pilate were not careful to crush him, Jesus of Nazareth might one day descend on Jerusalem from the hill country in the north. But they were more earnest, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. 